Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's program. Welcome to today's conversation at noon, critical movements that shaped a great state. My name is Rebecca Tabor Conover, and I'm head of public programs at um, the Connecticut Democracy Center at Connecticut's Old State House. We're delighted to be able to hold today's program today virtually. In a few minutes, I'll turn the program over to our speaker. I'd encourage you to post your questions in the comments section of Facebook underneath the live stream of today's program. We will be giving those questions to our speaker at the end of his talk, so we will answer them for you. I also want to let you know that you will be able to purchase a signed copy of Walt Woodward's new book. He'll give you that information in the course of today's presentation. It's now my distinct pleasure to introduce Dr. Walter Woodward. Walt is the State Historian of Connecticut, and he is an Associate Professor of History at the University of Connecticut. Walt is the narrator and producer of Today in Connecticut History with Connecticut Humanities and Grading the Nutmeg, the podcast of Connecticut History with Connecticut Explored Magazine. Walt also writes the From the State Historian column in Connecticut Explored. He is a widely sought after public speaker and historian. He lives in Columbia, Connecticut. Walt has authored several books, including the newly published Cre Creating Connecticut, Critical Moments That Shaped a Great State. Welcome, Walt. Thank you for being with us today. Hi. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank And thank everyone who is taking uh, part of their lunch hour to come and let me talk to you about my new book, Creating Connecticut. I have to tell you, this is a book I'm really excited about because I wrote it very consciously as both a historian and a public historian. I wanted to write a history that people who aren't academic historians might be interested in and excited about. When I thought about how I was gonna introduce this book uh, to people, I went back to my very first graduate seminar as a trainee historian with a wonderful professor named Richard D. Brown. I was so excited to be a graduate student and you know, becoming a real historian. And I didn't realize that that meant that you were gonna start reading history at a volume that was like drinking water out of a fire hose. So every week in Dick Brown's class, we had a whole book and six or seven or eight or nine articles. And we'd come in, seven or eight of us into the seminar room, and he would begin every single seminar for 15 weeks with the same question. Why did the author write this book? First time I heard it, I was, I was just taken by surprise because I'd never really thought about it. What is it that makes a person think something is so important that it's worth a substantial chunk of his or her time to research and write about it? And then why do they think that that is worth a substantial amount of your time to actually read what they had to say. So when I thought about introducing my book, I thought I am gonna go back to that seminar and I will begin, uh, I began my book with an introduction that is something I'm going to read to you from. And I'm gonna answer the question for you, as I did in the introduction, why I wrote this book. So with your permission, I'm gonna do a little sleight of hand here. I'm gonna share my screen. I think I'm gonna share my screen. Yes. Okay. And I'm gonna do a little bit of this. And here we go. All right, if I am doing this right, you've got me in a corner somewhere and you have, a, you have the cover of Creating Connecticut uh, on your screen. As Connecticut State Historian, I've had the good fortune to spend my career focusing my historical research on this state, its people, and their stories. Creating Connecticut is a product of that effort. It's a collection of 24 stories, 12 shorter, 12 longer, each of which tells us something important about Connecticut's past, something that still, in one way or another, affects our lives as Connecticut's today. All the stories are designed to be readable, engaging, 
and informative introductions to aspects of our state's history that will be new or nearly so to most readers. Some of the stories in Creating Connecticut show people we thought we knew, Mark Twain, Nathan Hale, in new and surprising ways. Some tell us about people many of us don't know, Eliezer Wheelock, Samson Ockham, Adrian Block, but perhaps ought to. And many are about events, movements, and periods of change, the Pequot War, the Hartford Witch Hunt, out-migration to Connecticut's Western Reserve, Irish immigration into the state, critical moments when Connecticut's were tested and called on by circumstance to change their minds, values, approaches, and even lives. And some are about the uniqueness of our state and the ways in which Connecticut's have celebrated their past in the past. The focus here is on stories that both interest and matter. You can read them from front to back. They're arranged more or less in chronological order or you can scan the table of contents and jump in with the story that seems most interesting to you. My hope in all of this is that you'll read them all and come away with the desire to know more about Connecticut history. Now, what I'd like to do with the rest of my talk is read a few passages from some of the stories in Creating Connecticut, then I'll answer any questions you may have and I'll close with telling you how you can get your own signed copy of this rare literary gem, right? And I'll begin with a reading from Creating Connecticut's first story about Connecticut's restless beginnings and the 50 years of conflict between the Dutch and English and indigenous people of this state, an era that is today an all but forgotten part of our history. It begins on a day in April in the year 1614. In the spring of 1614, Adrian Block sailed the little ship he had built and named Onrus, Restlessness, into the river the Algonquians called Connecticut, or the place of the long water. The 47-year-old Dutchman was as restless as his vessel and anxious to make up the losses he had experienced uh, <clears throat> the losses he had experienced the previous winter when his ship Tiger had accidentally burned to the waterline at Manhattan. The trader and explorer was anxious too to secure the Dutch government's promise of a trading monopoly over any new countries or harbors discovered by Dutch explorers. Restless to turn his fortunes around, Block came up a river that was itself restless, running fresh and full of upriver snowmelt and spring rain. He named the river the Versha, meaning fresh as in fast running, and as the first known European to probe its courses and seek its opportunities, he launched an era of restlessness that would change this river and its people forever. Then as now, restless had many meanings, and all would apply to the world the arrival of this little boat would create. A generation of restless Europeans, both Dutch and English, constantly in motion, never ceasing or pausing, would come to the Connecticut, the place of the long water, first in search of trade with the indigenous people, and soon after in quest of those people's lands and resources. Some of them were spiritually restless, troubled in mind and spirit, and seeking a place to serve their God as their consciences demanded. For the Native Americans already here, the arrival of the onrust heralded a new restlessness, first as they jostled to control distribution of European trade goods, and later as they fought the incoming insurgents' efforts to take their lands and control their lives. For Connecticut's first peoples, the arrival of the onrust brought centuries of restlessness, literal unrest, sleepless worry, sickness, turmoil, and death. Time is the acid rain of historical memory. Slowly, often over generations stretching into centuries, important details of the past can fade one by one until what was once crucial to the life of a time and people is all but forgotten. 
So it has been with the Dutch history of Connecticut. Most children, school children are still taught that the first European to come to Connecticut was Adrian Block. And many students of Hartford history know the Dutch had a trading house here, somewhere close to the later site of Samuel Colt's onion-domed arms manufacturing complex. But for the average Connecticut, that's the sum of it. The English arrived and the Dutch faded to black. The rest of the colonial story as they remember it is a simplistic tale of English versus Indians that quickly morphs into one about Patriots versus Tories. But that's not how it was. For its first 50 years, Connecticut was a restless, seething site of constant competition, pitting nation against nation, tribe against tribe, and colonies against colonies in a Rubik's Cube of combinations that always involved the Dutch. Nothing was done by the English at Connecticut without first calculating the Dutch response in New Netherland or at the States General, the seat of government in The Hague. No English settlement was expanded, no tribal alliance contracted, no trading venture launched without calculating the Dutch reaction. The Dutch Connecticut story was a deeply conflicted, sometimes harrowing experience. Those who lived in that time knew their lives depended on knowing it in detail. Now, I go on in this chapter to highlight the nearly continuous state of conflict between the various English plantations, Dutch authorities, and the Indian communities, and the shifting alliances that made life this restless and fearful struggle for everyone in Connecticut's first half century. It was a restless era that set the stage for much that came after it, including Connecticut's unique history of witch hunting. In another chapter, I try to answer many of the questions that history raises. Connecticut's record in handling witchcraft cases raises many questions. Some are unique to Connecticut, some apply to all witch hunts. Why, for examples, in the early years of witch hunting, 1647 to 63, was Connecticut New England's fiercest prosecutor of witches? Why did it switch from being the region's greatest witch killer to the colony that ended executions permanently a generation before Salem? Why did people even believe in witchcraft? What exactly did people think witches could do and why did it scare them? Why were most witches women? And what made someone who had been a neighbor for many years suddenly so dangerous that community safety made executing them mandatory? The answers to that lie not just in New England, but in the Puritan tradition, uh, excuse me, in the, in the tradition of, whoops, I've lost my place. Okay, did one of you cast a spell on me? Did you? You caught us, Walt. We were doing that. Oh my goodness. Give me a second here. Okay, I am back and excuse me. All right. What made someone who'd been a neighbor for many years suddenly so dangerous that community safety made executing them mandatory? No more spells now. The answer to those questions began not in Connecticut, but in Europe. And in the chapter, I trace the Renaissance history of witch hunting, explain the magical view of the world that made such hunts possible, and I discuss the English witch hunts that were peaking when the Puritans emigrated to Connecticut. The Puritans who came to New England in the early decades of the 1600s carried their fear of the devil and his minions to New England along with their Bibles, clothing, and seed stock. England's greatest witch hunt took place between 1644 and 1647 in the Puritan counties of East Anglia. There, a man named Matthew Hopkins 
who styled himself England's witch finder general, led a witch hunt that resulted in many executions. Some sources claim as many as 300. The East Anglian location of Hopkins' witch hunt is significant. It is the place from which many of Connecticut's early settlers emigrated. They knew much about, and some had direct connections to the Hopkins trials. Many must have feared that if the devil was assaulting the English Puritans this furiously in East Anglia, it was only a matter of time until he would find his way to New England. It's not surprising then that New England's first execution for witchcraft took place in 1647, just as the witch hunt in England was winding down. Perhaps the most interesting thing about this first New England witch death is that we wouldn't know anything about it except for two sentences that appeared in two different documents produced 100 miles away from each other and found some 250 years apart. Sometime between March and May of 1647, Massachusetts Governor John Winthrop, whose History Journal of New England is one of our most important historical sources from this period, wrote in that journal the following sentence. One, and he left a blank, of Windsor, arraigned and executed at Hartford for a witch. Winthrop left the blank space intending, no doubt, to add the witch's name once he'd received further information. But for the next 257 years, that's all that was known. Some person who lived in Windsor was tried for witchcraft in Hartford and then executed. What was she charged with? Who conducted the trial? Who testified against her? What was her defense? Where was she hanged? None of this was known. In truth, historians didn't even know whether New England's first convicted witch was a man or a woman. Then in 1904, Annie Elliott Trumbull, daughter of Connecticut's first state librarian, J. Hammond Trumbull, announced that she had come into possession of a little old volume with a worn sheepskin binding that contained the manuscript diary of Matthew Grant, a resident of Windsor from 1635 to 1681. In it, she reported, she had found a Grant penned entry stating that on May 26, 1647, Alice Young was hanged. Finally, after two and a half centuries, it was confirmed that New England's first executed witch was, as supposed, a woman, and that her name was Alice Young. That remains most of what is known for certain about her, though historian Richard Ross has recently argued that Alice emigrated to Windsor from London in 1640, which may have put her culturally at odds with her Windsor neighbors, most of whom had emigrated from the English West Country. Those cultural differences made her an outsider, he speculates, which combined with an epidemic of deadly influenza that hit Windsor the year of Young's execution may have factored in her being singled out for prosecution. <clears throat> the chapter goes on to detail Connecticut's record as early New England's fiercest prosecutor of witchcraft and how one man, Governor John Winthrop Jr., himself an alchemist and magic practitioner, intervened to bring witch executions in Connecticut to an end. It's a powerful story, I think, with a message as important as any from the better known Salem trials. I think you'd enjoy it. For the past decade, many Connecticuts, and especially our younger generation, have left our state to seek their fortunes elsewhere. This is truly troublesome, but it's not the first time it's happened. In another chapter, I tell the story of the great outflux of young Connecticuts in the early 1800s, as the dream or necessity of finding a better life took them to a part of Ohio known as the Connecticut Western Reserve. Here are a few passages that talk about their journeys west and their feelings about leaving. Connecticut in the early 19th century, as in the 21st century, was hemorrhaging its young people, the lifeblood of its future, to other more economically attractive locations. 
and it had been doing so for a long time. Although they dispersed to sites both far and near, one area in particular proved the most powerful magnet for Connecticut expatriates. This was part of Northeast Ohio, stretching 120 miles from uh, west from the Pennsylvania border, a place many people called New Connecticut, but which was also known and is today still called Connecticut's Western Reserve. This was a part of its original charter territory that Connecticut reserved ownership of when it ceded the remainder of the charter lands to the newly formed United States in 1786. The journey west was both long and hard, between 500 and 650 miles, depending on the route selected and the destination. Road conditions range from very bad to deplorable for most of the journey. In heavy rains, roads became mud pits and streams impassable. In some low-lying or wetland areas, efforts were made to ameliorate the muddy conditions by building corduroy roads of logs placed perpendicular to the direction of travel, which provided their own unique kind of jarring discomfort. It was an experience no traveler would ever forget. In addition to the considerable physical dangers of traveling bad roads, fording swelled streams and rivers, and climbing and descending high mountain passes, migrants commonly experienced inhospitable treatment at overcrowded and often squalid inns and taverns. They slept fitfully among strangers, ate bad food with rowdy, drunken, and sometimes dangerous fellow migrants, and they fought off both homesickness and fear of the unknown. How did all these migrants feel about pulling up roots and leaving their natal, natal, native state? Some undoubtedly felt a pioneer's excitement at facing a world that was all possibility. Others, perhaps the younger sons not in line to inherit the family farm, seethed with resentment about being forced into exile. Some, it is clear, saw having to leave Connecticut for the West as a sign of shame, a visible symbol that they were the expendable ones. How else can we explain Margaret Van Horn Dwight's comment on day two of her journey. The country we pass through till we are beyond New York, I need not describe to you, nor indeed could I, for I am attended by a very unpleasant, though not uncommon companion, one to whom I have bowed in subjection ever since I left you, pride. It has entirely prevented me seeing the country, lest I should be known, and so I suppose it will attend me to the mountains, then I am sure it will bid me adieu. Hiding in the wagon so she wouldn't be recognized. This is an aspect about migration that we rarely encounter or even think about. Once we do though, it complicates long-standing views of Anglo's hot in pursuit of manifest destiny. Surely, Connecticut's left their state with mixed emotions. But even as young Connecticut's were moving out of the state, others were moving in. Connecticut had found its future in harnessing its abundant water power to drive the factories of the Industrial Revolution. And that created an unprecedented need for workers to build a new kind of infrastructure. The Irish in Connecticut chapter covers nearly three 350 years of the Irish story here. But today I'd like to present three snapshots. One of what it was like for the Irish who arrived in Connecticut in the years just before the potato famine of the mid 1840s. And then what life was like for the children and grandchildren of those migrants 50 years later. And finally, what it means to be an Irish Connecticut today. Enter the Irish. To meet the need for laborers, contractors for the Farmington Canal brought in 28 gangs of Irish canal workers called navvies from Galway and Cork. Hartford brought in 400 Irishmen for the Enfield Canal project. Life for the navvies was hellish. 
like the Irish railroad track workers who soon followed them, they dug furiously sun up to sunset, goaded by overseer contractors whose profits depended on how much labor they could extract every day. Eyewitnesses marveled at the physical prowess of the Irishmen as they ran full wheelbarrows up narrow planks from ditches 20 foot deep. They lived in temporary shanty camps where overcrowding, poor sanitation, and stagnant water made disease a constant. Alcohol was woven into a workday marked by short bursts of furious digging, followed by a trip to the whiskey barrel and a dram from the jigger boss. Irish workers were paid only for the day's weather and their health let them work, and they earned just 75 cents a day, one third less than native born laborers. The navvies represented Connecticut's first major influx of practicing Irish Catholics, and the descendants of Connecticut's Puritan founders didn't like it one bit. Connecticut had no resident priests, and the Yankees made it clear they'd very much like to keep it that way. When Reverend John Powers of New York requested permission to celebrate mass for canal workers at New Haven's Protestant Seamen's Chapel on Long Wharf, he was told, we have no popery in New Haven and we don't want any. Despite the overt intolerance, popery did come to Connecticut, at first through the services of an itinerant priest from Rhode Island, who in 1828 conducted house masses on the east bank of the Connecticut River in Hartford. The following year, Hartford became home to Most Holy Trinity, Connecticut's first Catholic church. The newspaper Connecticut Observer was aghast. How will it read in history that in 1829, Hartford in the state of Connecticut was made the center of a Roman Catholic mission? shock and awe. But let's flash forward 50 years later and see how the children and grandchildren of those first migrants are faring. Unlike their fathers, by 1900, two thirds of second generation Irishmen worked in skilled trades or higher with economic security mirroring that of the Connecticut Yankees. Irish American men dominated police and fire departments and monopolize the building trades. And while 90% of their mothers remain domestic uh, servants, second generation Irish American daughters rose to become clerks, skilled factory workers, teachers, and union organizers too. Better jobs came in part because of high Irish involvement in Connecticut's labor movement. Irish Americans made up most of many unions' membership and leadership. Now let's flash forward to what it is like to be an Irish American today. To be Irish in Connecticut today is, for those lucky enough to claim Irish American ancestry, a source of both identity and pride, underscored by an extraordinary long-term record of Irish Connecticut's achievements in politics, law, public safety, commerce, industry, and culture. The fact that such achievements were made by a people once reviled as incapable, discriminated against as inferior, and treated as unwelcome interlopers in the society that took offense at their presence is an important reminder, especially in times like these, that the very people we fear at one moment can sometimes turn out to be the source of some of our society's greatest strengths. Connecticut's most important cultural icon, and we're home to many, is the Gilded Age author and satirist Samuel Clement, it's Mark Twain. His historic home in Hartford is also one of the country's great historic landmarks. In Mark Twain and the Historic House Problem, I come right out and ask the question I think most people think to themselves when they visit the house of this great man, why can't I smell smoke? Twain was no ordinary smoker. He was a deeply committed, unregenerate, professional pipe and cigar smoker 
who mastered his craft at an early age and continued to improve upon it for the next 68 years. In the great age of industrial production, Twain turned himself into a literary factory, belching cigar smoke as the words poured forth. Wherever Twain went, tobacco smoke followed, and one of his greatest fears was to be where tobacco wasn't. In 1867, one day before sailing to Honolulu from British Columbia, Twain found a local wholesale tobacconist and brought 3,000 cheroots and 15 pounds of tobacco. That was about one cigar per nautical mile of the impending voyage. Later that afternoon, he went back and bought 3,000 more cheroots. That night, shortly after beginning a farewell public lecture, Twain stopped his talk in midstream, called his manager up to the stage and said, Pond, I fear that cigar place may close before I get through here. Go there now and get 1,500 more of those cheroots. In the morning, Twain and his 7,500 cigars plus his tobacco happily embarked for the Sandwich Isles. Now, Twain knew smoking was generally unhealthy, but he saw the habit as a kind of life vest that provided a wellness safety margin. He told the story of the doctor who visited an 80-year-old woman who was in rapidly failing health. You must stop drinking, he told her. I never touched a drop of alcohol in my life, she answered. Then you must immediately give up smoking, the doctor said. I have never, ever smoked, she said indignantly. Well then, the doctor replied, there is no way I can help you. You are a sinking ship with no freight to throw overboard. I suspect most people would agree that elections in recent years, at least some of them, have left people on both sides of the political aisle with a bad taste in their mouths. That's why it might be time to revive one of our state's oldest and for centuries most time-honored traditions, the Connecticut election cake. What's an election cake and why is it a Connecticut tradition? An election cake was a big, rich fruit, spice, and sugar yeast cake baked up in huge quantities and served to all comers during the festivities surrounding first our colonies and later our state's annual elections. The story of how election cake became a Connecticut tradition goes all the way back to the days of the Puritans. One of the things that made the Puritans so pure was that they didn't believe in the annual round of Catholic and Anglican holidays. They didn't celebrate Christmas or Easter or any of the numerous saints and festival days. And for them, New Year's Day came on March 26th. So no midnight kisses or dropping ball either. While they rejected all these supposedly invented occasions for mirth, they did believe that in the year 1662, Connecticut, for reasons still not exactly clear, got something that very much was worth celebrating, a royal charter from King Charles II that gave the Connecticut colony virtual independence more than a century before the American Revolution. Unlike Massachusetts and Virginia and the other royally governed American colonies, Connecticut could make its own laws and more important, elect its own leaders without royal oversight. This right to choose their own leaders was seen from the start as fundamentally important and distinctive, worth celebrating and worth protecting. So it's not surprising that on those days when Connecticut's gathered to choose their leaders, back then election day took place in early May, these otherwise celebration starved Puritans found reason to celebrate and what better way to do so than with cake and lots of it. <clears throat> we know Connecticuts were feasting on election day cakes well before the American Revolution because the colonial records tell us so. And if incorporating election cake into the ceremonies was an important Connecticut tradition before the American Revolution, it became even more important after. 
as Connecticuts themselves spread across the country to the new lands in the American West, the election cake tradition went with them. Election cake recipes appear in early cookbooks in states across the nation, and they are abundantly found in the manuscript cookbooks left by individuals in our historical societies and archives. Reading these works, a few things becomes crystal clear. Election cakes were central to the election rituals in many places, but especially here in Connecticut. Making an extraordinary election cake, perhaps with, one, with one's own special ingredient or unique mixing process, became a point of honor with many homekeepers. Having a reputation for making delicious election cakes became a source of competitive status. During the 1800s, as Connecticut industrialized, welcomed people from many new nations, broke its official ties to the old Puritan church, and experienced the sectional divide that led to the American Civil War, some of Connecticut's time-honored election day traditions, riding out to meet the new governor as he made his way into the Capitol, and parading behind the state's ministers to hear an election sermon in the first congregational church, these fell by the wayside but the election cake remained a steady and delicious habit. When the General Assembly finally decided in 1876 to change the start of its sessions from May to early January, beginning in 1877, a journalist lamenting the switch of election day to midwinter wrote this, the coming election parade of May 1876 is likely to be the last that will take place in Connecticut. Though the sermon has gone out, though the parade is going out, though the whole institution may become an element of the past, one feature of it will always remain, and that is the election cake. Perhaps this is exactly the right time for the Connecticut election cake to make its comeback. At this moment, when American politics seems so divisive and so bitter, wouldn't it be great if a cohort of culinary Connecticuts, men and women equally this time, joined together to use their ovens to remind people that democracy, the right to choose the people who rule your government, is a sweet privilege indeed. And what better way could there be to celebrate sweet democracy than to bring back the tradition of the Connecticut election cake. And in case, you know, you may be thinking, that's kind of interesting, I'd like to try that. I included in the book a modern day with modern ingredients uh, recipe for the election cake. Now, if you don't want to buy the book and you want to try the election cake, write down my email address at the end and I will send you out the recipe because I really would like to see uh, the election cake make a comeback. So that's an overview of creating Connecticut, the 24 stories. Now that's not all 24. What you've heard is a sampler. In addition, there are stories on the rough justice meted out by the British to Connecticut state hero, Nathan Hale, a recounting of 1935's Pull Out All the Stops 300th anniversary of Connecticut's founding the inspiring 275-year-old story of the Lyman family's whatever-it-takes devotion to make and keep Lyman orchards a thriving Connecticut farm, a story about the Puritans' only art form, gravestone carving, a profile of Irish-born Governor John Dempsey, the only immigrant governor of Connecticut since the colonial era, and a meditation on just what it is that makes Connecticut such a unique state. And I close with a very personal story about finally, you know, pretty late in life, coming home to realize my childhood dream, owning the house built by my sixth great grandfather, which I'm talking to you from here in Columbia. I hope you like what you've, what you've heard enough to want to read more, because that's why I wrote this book. And if you do, I hope you'll check out a copy of Creating Connecticut from the library, pick one up at your local bookstore, or order one online. And if you'd like to get a signed copy of Creating Connecticut, 
please make a note of this email address. It's also, or the phone number, but the email address I'm kind of proud of because it is the shortest email address at the University of Connecticut. Hard to snag that one. But if you will email me or give me a call, I'll be happy to send you out a signed copy with you know, all inclusive for $25. And uh, I, have, I have figured out how to take Visa and MasterCard too, so we can make it easy and simple. What's most important is that you read the book and I don't care how you get hold of it, but I really do hope you will read it. State history has such a powerful impact on our lives. And yet in most uh, curriculum, it is somewhat of an afterthought. And I, I wrote this book to help people see just how fascinating our history is and to you know, encourage more interest in history. I'm gonna stop now. I'll be, happy to, um, I'll be happy to answer any questions you have. And I certainly thank you so much for taking your lunch hour and joining me today for Creating Kinetic. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Um, we do have some questions who have, that have come in uh, for you to okay. answer. Um, from Steve Courtney, he wrote that it's a wonderful wrap up of our state history. I would agree with that. And uh, before he has to run out to buy the book, tell us a little bit about your earlier uh, work Prosperous America. Oh my goodness. Okay. The Prosperous America is a, it's actually a very different book than this. It is an academic monograph, which means it's got 85 million footnotes and the research is painstakingly detailed. It tells the story of Governor John Winthrop Jr., who was one of Connecticut's most important early leaders. And he, he was the person who intervened uh, to, with uh, another man named Gershom Bulkley to help put an end to witchcraft trials in Connecticut, which is most fascinating because he was also an alchemist. He was a healer. He was a practitioner of magic. So he knew, uh, he knew magic. He knew what people were being accused of. And he, frankly, uh, in my opinion, didn't believe that uh, the people accused were were uh, possible that that they that it was possible for them to have done it. So he intervened to make sure no one was executed on his watch. He also was he was the founder of New London. He was the founder of Saybrook and of Well, I think we've encountered a little technical difficulty here. Um, we seem to have lost Walt. If everyone can hang on with us for just a moment, we'll see about bringing him back on. It looks like Walt is back. Oh my goodness, yes, I had a computer die. Oh dear, well welcome back, Walt. We, we just you. had a- I am, uh, once again, when you work with technology, you have to be prepared for anything, right? That's right. I was about to start uh, a song and dance, so um, I'm, glad you're, I'm glad you're back. We have a couple, um, you were answering about your previous book, um, and uh, we appreciate that answer. Um, one thing that um another question that came in for us uh was that from brian co-francesco who wondered um well what was the most surprising thing you learned while you were writing this book i i was surprised over and over again in this book uh, i think there are a couple of i, I was genuinely surprised at how fascinating the state stories are when you when you dig into them and uncover them. This is a state that is um, it's, it, it is rich in history. We're one of the original 13 colonies, but there wasn't, you know, I could have done I could have done another 30 stories on Connecticut history that had, you know, that had just as rich messages and meanings. The thing I like about the stories in this book is that I think 
many of them have a very direct resonance with the presence. Connecticut is a Connecticut is a place where the past and the immediate moment have been in conversation for over 300 years. And as you uncover these stories, you can see these ties between past and present and these negotiations. It is, it, it is my hope that by, by uh, providing a vehicle that helps people look back at the past and these early conversations, they may find some insights into the way we're dealing with similar issues in the present. So the, the, I guess, thank you, Brian, for the question. And I think my answer is, is that the, the past really does, uh, it really is, it, it is a good guide to thinking about the present. History doesn't repeat itself, but it sure does rhyme. Well, and also, uh, you know, it seems, you know, that uh, I think a lot of people, we think, oh, other, th you know, important things happened in other states, and we forget how many things happened in our own little state. I, I, I you would be hard pressed, I think, to come away from this book and not realize that even in the American psyche, Connecticut had an intensely important role, especially up until I would say about the time of the Civil War, when you know the Grand National, when the Union kind of took precedence over in people's minds over everything, when the United States really became the dominant political and I think cultural force. But Connecticut during the colonial period and in the early national period, because of this long tradition of relative political independence exerted an incredibly impor important influence on shaping American values and institutions. That's part of how we got the uh, nickname Land of Steady Habits, right? We were, we were the place that people looked to for that, that kind of traditional stability. And Connecticut, Connecticut uh, marketed that very effectively. I, I guess they were going around during the early national period saying we're still unrevolutionary. <laughs> um, you kind of touched on this already, Walt, but from Kevin Flood, we had a question, um, were there stories that you wanted to include but couldn't because of time or space limitation? Um, and what every, I think, newly published author wants to hear, what about a volume two? I, you know, I hope, I wrote this book very consciously for a public audience. And I hope that I, I am the state historian. I feel like my remit, my mission is to, to help people understand how important and relevant their state's history is to their own lives. And it's my hope that people will read this history and instead of taking it like medicine, you know, they'll think of it as a, a, a they'll think of it as something really enjoyable. I made the book a collection of long and short stories, so and I covered a long time period. So you can kind of dip in and dip out. If you have a little time, you can read one or two stories. If you had a lot of time, you can sit down with one of the longer ones. This is really meant to be accessible. If it is, if the book is is successful, I already have half of the next book done, and I've got. You know, I've got the I've got the ideas for the stories on the third book. I, I really <laughs> like this format. It, it's been it's been a joy for me to write in it. I hope people will enjoy it. And you know, if you do or you don't enjoy it, I would welcome hearing from you about it. it it's I want this to be a book that people people like history, but maybe haven't you know become historians read and and your feedback on it would be of inestimable value to me well i think we all would enjoy a volume too for sure um from tom paquette he asked um when does the audio version of the book come out um i'd love to hear the whole thing read to us by walt uh thank you tom right tom paquette tom paquette tom thank you so much what a nice thing for you to say I, uh, wow, that, um, well, I'll tell you, there is a little piece of the audio book out. I actually, 
just yesterday uploaded a new podcast on grading the nutmeg, which is one of the stories in the book. It is about rough justice for Nathan Hale. The, I, I talked about that chapter. And uh, I, I did make actually uh, an audio podcast out of it. Now I'm not gonna do that with the other stories in the book, but I wanted to do it with this one, both because I think it's a, a, a very significant story. And because as you'll see in the first five minutes of it, it is a story that lent itself to, uh, to an opening that really called for a kind of audio beginning. So it's, you, can, you can find that story at, you can Google grating the nutmeg and find the one that's a podcast and click on it. Or you can go to gratingthenutmeg.libsyn.com. If you have a smart device in your house, you can say, Alexa, play <laughs> the most recent grating the nutmeg. Sorry, if I do that, Alexa, if I finish it. I couldn't find grading the nut. There you go. <laughs> well, um, actually, audio uh, is the uh, kind of the theme for our next question. Um, Walt, those of us who know you know you've had a varied career, including being a uh, Emmy award-winning songwriter, um, or I'm sorry, Grammy award-winning songwriter. And um, so music is a really uh, strong, uh, part of what you do, also playing with the band of steady habits as well. Um, well, um, this question comes from Marina, uh, excuse me, Mariana Garcia, who asks, Walt, did you have a music playlist that you listened to while you were writing? That, that is a wonderful question, and the answer is no. The, and the reason it's a no is because one of the curses of being a musician and a songwriter is that music can like derail you i have trouble listen listening to music in the background anytime because it grabs hold of me and then i can't let go of it so the it is very hard for me to concentrate on writing while i'm listening to music but it is wonderful when i get the writing done to sit there and think about the music that fits what's been written. So uh, that is what the Band of Steady Habits is about. We, um, we actually take historical, we make historical presentations about certain topics, and then we include in those presentations, which have PowerPoints and, you know, it's a, it's a nice rich thing. We include, uh, we include songs that really resonate with the story. So uh, Mariana, I would invite you to come. Hopefully, we're going to be doing live presentations, you know, soon. So please, please, with our lips to God's ears soon. And uh, I'd love to have you come be our guest at one of them. If you, if you do come to a Band of Steady Habits performance, please come introduce yourself to me because I will remember this question. You just say, I'm the playlist person. <laughs> Well, Walt, you've been our state historian now for several years. Do you have a favorite memory from your tenure as state historian? That's a really, that's a great question. I, um, I, I, you know, I love this job so much. To, to be the state historian of Connecticut is, in a lot of ways, it's my dream come true. and. I, I, it, there is a category of thing that is my greatest memory. It's my greatest pleasure. And it's so, this, this probably will sound cheesy, but it's really true to be able to talk to people and share the history of this state with the audiences around the state. I've gotten more pleasure out of that than, um, than almost anything I can think of. It really is. It's the most satisfying part of my job. The, the most wonderful single event is the last chapter of my book. It is, it is being able to buy and live in this house that was built by my sixth great grandfather that when I was five years old, I said, one day I'm gonna live in that house. 
when I was in the music business and making a lot of money, I once tried to buy the house by people who saw my name on it, knew why I wanted it and raised the price so high I could not buy it or would not buy it. And yet finally this dream deferred became a reality. So I live in a house where generations of my family lived and died and it's, um, it's, it's, and I'm the state historian of their place. So pretty wonderful thing. <laughs> well, I think that's a great ending spot for us. I don't see that any other questions have come through. Um, Walt, I wanna thank you for joining us virtually and I wanna thank all of our audience members for staying, hanging in there with us as we uh, navigated our first virtual program and hit a few little uh, glitches, but thank you for being with us. I wanna let people know that um, on June the 23rd, the Old State House will be hosting our farmer's market. And of course, we will be observing all proper protocol on that in terms of social distancing, but that will be taking place on Tuesdays and Fridays. So we hope you'll come out into Hartford, come to the farmer's market, um, get some fresh produce to enjoy, and celebrate the start of summer. So thank you so much, Walt. Thank you to all of our audience members for joining us. It was great to have you, and we'll see you soon. Thank you, everyone. I really appreciate having lunch with you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.